My name is Eva Bizek and I am the Secretary General of IOMP and will be moderating uh, today's presentation. Before I introduce our speaker, I would like to just uh, have a couple of house rules. You will be all muted during the presentation so as to not have any uh, disruptions during the talk. We will also ask you to remove your video during the presentation so that we uh, reduce the demands on the bandwidth. During the talk, please type your questions into chat. I will be recording your questions and I will be then moderating the questions and answers session post presentation but type them into chat as soon as you are interested in something. So let me just share my screen for a moment. Share. Can I please confirm that you can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, so it is my absolute pleasure to invite Susie Lydiat from ACRF ImageX Institute at the University of Sydney to talk to us today about cardiac radioablation, a bit of an introduction, an overview, and how medical physicists could help shape its future. Lydia is a part-time PhD student at the Institute under the leadership of Professor Paul Keel, who might be known to many of you. And her PhD is investigating cardiac radioablation for atrial fibrillation, a new and developing non-invasive treatment that is alternative for the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia. Her work is specifically evaluating the feasibility of an MRI-guided treatment on an MRI linux using non-invasive target tracking and MLC tracking. Susie also works as a clinical radiation oncology medical physicist at the Kathleen Kilger Center in New Zealand. It's actually 11 p.m. for Susie, one hour before midnight. So I really greatly appreciate her dedicating this time to us. And over to you, Susie. Well, greetings from New Zealand, and thank you for the introduction, Eva. Um, firstly, before we start, we do want to run a quick poll. Okay, Magdalena, can I please ask you to help us with the poll? And I, uh, this is basically testing your knowledge about cardiac ablation. And I encourage everyone to submit your answer. And while we're doing that, can I confirm that my screen, my PowerPoint slide can yes, be seen? We can see. So the first Wait. question, how do you rate your level of knowledge about cardiac radioablation? Okay, thank you. So at the moment, most of the people heard about it, but don't understand it or know absolutely nothing about it. Can I have a question too, Magdalena? Question two, compared to atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia is more common. Single choice. Okay, so again, it looks like that most of the people select, we do not know anything about atrial fibrillation and ventricular tachycardia. Thank you, Magdalena. Can we have question three? Question three. In your opinion, cardiac radio ablation, and please, please select one of the options. Okay, so the answers that we are getting now are indicated either the participants do not know enough about it, or it has been used to treat a small number of patients. 
Thank you. Can we have the last question? Question four, what statement is the most correct? We're asking whether atrial fibrillation affects how many people around the world. So most of the people would either do not know or think it's over 30 million. Thank you very much. And we will see, we will repeat the poll at the end of the presentations to see whether our knowledge has improved. Thank you, Magdalena. Thank you. Um, so everyone can see my slides. Yep, brilliant. Um, well, as Eva introduced, today I'm going to give a broad overview of cardiac radioablation, summarize the physics procedure and techniques currently being used in clinical treatments, and highlight possible research and development opportunities. We will ask those same questions at the end, and hopefully most of you will be able to leave knowing a little bit more about cardiac radioablation. Cardiac radioablation is also known as stereotactic arrhythmic radioablation, and the basic concept is that we can use external beam radiation to non-invasively irradiate a specific region of the heart. Rather than using radiation to kill cancer cells, we're using radiation to induce an immune response that hopefully cures cardiac arrhythmias. Cardiac arrhythmias are caused by a disruption of the natural electrical signal of the heart. Ventricular tachycardia, or VT, is where the lower chambers of the heart beat rapidly. This reduces the efficiency of the heart pumping and can cause sudden cardiac arrest requiring immediate medical attention. There are multiple causes of VT, but it's most commonly caused by damage to the heart tissue, for example, after a heart attack or inflammation. Rather than normal electrical pathways, as shown in the green in the figure on the right, the scar tissue creates abnormal electrical pathways in the ventricles, as shown in red, and this causes the ventricles to beat rapidly. Atrial fibrillation, or AF, is where the upper chambers of the heart quiver and is the most common sustained cardiac arrhythmia and increases your chance of stroke by 500%. AF is most commonly caused by unwanted electrical signals traveling from the pulmonary veins into the left atria and disrupting the natural cardiac electrical signal. The main current treatment options are shown here. Drugs are used to restore and maintain regular heart cycles and reduce side effects such as strokes. However, patients often exhibit toxicities and the drugs are not always effective long term. ICDs are commonly implanted in patients suffering from VT as it reduces the risk of cardiac arrest. However, it does this by shocking the heart and therefore the patient, and this can obviously reduce the quality of life and lacks any preventative effect. Catheter ablation involves inserting catheters into the heart via veins in the leg and ablating regions in the heart internally. This, however, needs to be performed in a theatre and the patient requires GA, so it is not suitable treatment option for all patients. It is also a very technical procedure with variable success rates, around 50% in some cohorts. Catheter ablation for VT can be challenged by the depth or size of the region of cardiac tissue that is disrupting the natural electrical signal. And for AF, the catheter ablation procedure needs to, be, needs to carefully induce sufficient scarring to block the conduction of the unwanted signals from entering into the left atria. However, during a catheter ablation procedure, the electrophysiologist can electrically stimulate tissue to assess the electrical conduction and determine whether more ablation is required prior to finishing. Cardiac radioablation is a non-invasive treatment alternative to catheter ablation. We are trying to induce comparable tissue injuries as catheter ablation by using external beam radiation. 
From a literature search, I quickly produced this graph to illustrate the approximate number of publications on the topic in the last two decades. Cardiac radioablation was invented 20 years ago, and a number of initial animal feasibility and dose escalation studies were performed, mostly by CyberHeart. The first human treatments were delivered eight to nine years ago, but the number of publications and interest in the field has significantly grown in the last few years. This is perhaps due to a 2017 paper illustrating great initial clinical results, which was consequently labelled a game changer by the New York Times. My PhD supervisor, Dr. Paul Keel, asked me recently, is cardiac radioablation the next lung saver? It's a good question, so what did he mean by this? Very briefly looking back at history, the concept of lung saver originated in the early 2000s as a new treatment technique for patients suffering with, with inoperable lung cancers. It then gained rapid but well-deserved attention. A lot of the skills and technology from standard fractionated radiotherapy and SRS were transferable. However, further investigation, thought and development of technology and procedures was required to gain confidence in reliable clinical outcomes. This technique has now become a much more accessible treatment option for patients and not just those with inoperable lung cancers. Large driving factors for this fairly rapid and widespread clinical adoption was the clear clinical need, early promising clinical results, the ability to transfer established skills and technology, as well as the development and verification of treatment delivery techniques that establish confidence in clinical outcomes. So the question is, could cardiac radioablation follow the same path and soon become a globally available and clinically proven treatment for patients suffering from cardiac arrhythmias? Well, there is clear clinical need. Many patients suffering from cardiac arrhythmias get to the point where they have limited or no further treatment options and are experiencing poor quality of life. Already, cardiac arrhythmias are a major socioeconomic concern, and the prevalence of these diseases are increasing due to our aging population. To give an idea, currently over 33 million people globally suffer from atrial fibrillation. But in less than 10 years, this has been predicted to more than double, making it a very immediate and concerning socioeconomic concern. The initial clinical results of cardiac radioablation for VT have been very promising. The largest amount of clinical data so far has come from the Washington University team, and the initial findings found that cardiac radioablation greatly reduced the number of VT episodes in 94% of their patients and improved their quality of life. Now, just a few years later, cardiac radioablation is already being used around the world within clinical trials or offered as a palliative treatment. So cardiac radioablation does show a lot of lung similarities to lung saber, but there's still a lot to learn before it can be safely accessible to the patients in need globally. While I like to be an optimistic, it is also important to be realistic about the potential benefits cardiac radioablation could have. Using the slowly jar analogy and very approximate values, AF is the most prevalent and VT is the least prevalent out of AF, VT and lung cancer. But while lung saber is a suitable treatment option for say approximately 10% of lung cancers, Cardiac radioablation appears suitable for only a fraction of VT patients and would only be considered for an extremely small amount of AF patients. But nevertheless, cardiac radioablation presents a particularly exciting opportunity for medical physicists. We can use our radiation oncology and imaging expertise to collectively help improve the clinical treatments and clinical outcomes for patients suffering from another debilitating disease. To help illustrate this, I'm going to summarize the techniques and procedures used in clinical cardiac radioablation treatments and highlight knowledge gaps for potential technology advancements. Most of the content of this aspect of the talk is from this review paper that we published earlier in the year. 
Most clinical cardiac radioablation treatments have followed a typical radiation oncology workflow, with the main difference being mostly in the pre-planning stage. Unlike oncology treatments, electrophysiology information and scar imaging are often acquired to help delineate the treatment target. For VT treatments, the first step requires identifying the location of the tissue that is disrupting the natural electrical signal. This is commonly performed with ECGs to locate the general proximity of the target area and 3D electroanatomical mapping to identify areas of the heart tissue with reduced electrical conduction. Electroanatomical mapping, however, is minimally evasive. A non-invasive CT-based Electro surface electrocardiographic imaging technique has been utilized, but its suitability has not been well established, and at times its spatial resolution can be limited. For AF treatments, often circumferential lesions around the pulmonary veins are drawn on a CT data set, as shown in green, using the knowledge from prior clinical scar imaging and electrophysiology data. Combining electrophysiology data with radiotherapy CT planning data sets within treatment planning systems is also not straightforward, but I'll discuss this more shortly. Another key difference is in regards to motion management. Because these intracardiac targets undergo both respiratory induced and cardiac induced target motion. This motion is perhaps the most complex yet encountered in radiation therapy. To illustrate, shown here are the motion trajectories for prostate cancer, lung cancer, and a cardiac radioablation target, with each color representing two-dimensional motion. So it's important that we evaluate the motion of the specific target and choose appropriate motion management techniques. For clinical treatments delivered on C-arm Linux, Target motion has mostly been assessed with free breathing respiratory gated 4D CT at the time of the planning simulation appointment. This captures cardiorespiratory combined target motion due to cardiac motion blurring. Clinical treatments using gating or tracking for respiratory motion have assessed cardiac induced target motion with ECG gated CT scans in systole and diastole, transthoracic echoes, or fluoroscopy of ICD leads with fiducials during transient breath holds. One group used a predefined population average motion estimate, and MRI has been used in clinical MRI guided treatment and target motion characterization studies. Unfortunately, the magnitude of target motion has not often been reported in published clinical studies. One group reported that motion from respiratory gated 4D CT with abdominal compression was on average 3 to 5 mils in each two dimension, but could be up to 12 mils. Target motion characterization studies have reported respiratory motion in the range of 5 to 17 mils and cardiac induced motion to be on average below 5 mils with maximum displacements up to 12 mils. The Washington University group recently reported that target motion measured on cardiac gated breath hold 4CD, 4D CT was actually off often larger than motion measured on the respiratory gated free breathing 4D CT in at least one dimension, which does interestingly question the suitability of some motion management strategies. Additionally, multiple target motion studies have illustrated that structures even in close proximity to the target, including ICD leads, are not always suitable surrogates for target motion. Interfraction motion and breath hold compliance also needs to be considered. This paper was the first study to analyze interfraction motion of cardiac substructures with MRI to define substructure specific safety margins to ensure effective cardiac sparing in the general radiotherapy context. They concluded that anisotropic planning PRV expansions of three to five mils are needed. Just visually looking at the exemplar MR sim and daily treatment imaging, you can see that lack of breath hold compliance in some patients can cause large displacements in cardiac substructures. Respiratory motion management techniques are well established in radiation oncology, and we have a good understanding on the accuracy and limitations. However, to date, there's been little investigation into the suitability of these techniques for cardiac motion. 
Slab enough treatments have used X-ray-based marker tracking for respiratory motion management and an ITV for cardiac motion management. Treatments on CRM Linux have mostly used a cardiorespiratory combined ITV with or without abdominal compression. One treatment has used respiratory gating via an external surrogate. However, another pu publication questioned the advantages of respiratory gated treatments. There's been one published case study on an MRI Linux, and this was mostly a breath hold delivery with liver dome tracking. Cardiac motion management was not discussed and initial attempts at MRI guided tracking of heart structures or the esophagus proved difficult due to imaging artifacts caused by the ICD. The concepts of ECG gated treatment deliveries, MRI guided tracking and MLC tracking for combined cardiorespiratory motion have been illustrated but only in phantom studies so far. It's also important to consider target proximity to surrounding structures. For example, multiple studies have reported that the esophagus is in direct contact with atrial fibrillation cardiac radioablation targets in up to 75% of patients. This highlights the importance of careful selection of motion management, because if it goes wrong, the clinical effect could be drastic. So there are a number of important scientific questions and research and development opportunities in the area of pre-planning. It would be advantageous to have a better understanding on the spatial accuracy and registration errors of electrophysiology tools, as well as further development of non-invasive electrophysiology tools. We could also improve our ability to acquire accurate information in the presence of cardiorespiratory motion and get further guidance on optimal imaging modalities for assessing target motion. Further guidance on optimal motion management techniques, particularly for cardiac induced motion, is vitally needed, and this may include the development of new techniques specifically tailored for the complex motion of these targets. Further analysis of surrogate suitability is also needed. Moving on to treatment planning and design. Treatment planning was always performed on 3D or 4D CT acquisitions and standard thoracic and abdominal SABU mobilizations were typically used. The information from a number of electrophysiology and imaging data sets are often used to help delineate the target on the planning CT. However, currently importing electrophysiology information into commercial treatment planning systems is not feasible. Additionally, target delineation requires the close collaboration and communication between electrophysiologists and radiation oncologists. Accurate and reproducible target delineation is critical for achieving effective treatments with minimal collateral damage to the heart tissue, but currently there are no established guidelines and standardization of target delineation. Some methods for transferring electrophysiology information to the planning CT have included just doing a side-by-side -side visual comparison, dual registrations, using non-commercial software products, or using the American Heart Association 17-segment left ventricle model. This recently published paper suggests an approach based on the established 17-segment heart model. It provides a clear and reproducible framework that both electrophysiologists and radiation oncologists could use as a reference for delineating the target and communicating the location of the target. And these two groups have developed workflows and processes to allow the accurate registration of electroanatomical map data sets directly to the planning CT DICOM data sets. They have predominantly performed this within 3D Slicer, a free software product. The Raventa clinical trial group performed a benchmarking study looking into the VT substrate identification and target volume generation process. They sent three cases to five participating centers for independent CTV generation. This study used a manual transfer process based on the anatomic comparison between the electroanatomical map and planning CT. They found that the extent and localization of the VT substrate on the electroanatomical map showed minor visual differences as seen in the top row, but the CTVs differed considerably more in terms of both position and dimension as shown in the bottom row. This, sorry, 
This clearly illustrates a loss of agreement during the transfer process from the electrophysiology studies to the planning CT. These findings emphasize the importance of performing cardiac radioablation under well-defined protocols and in clinical trials with benchmarking. In terms of treatment planning, target volume or ITV to PTV margin expansions have ranged from zero to eight mils and PTV volumes have ranged from 3.5 to 300 cc. All but one clinical cardiac radioablation treatment has prescribed 25 gray in a single delivery. Currently, the optimal target dose is relatively unknown. A number of preclinical dose escalation studies were performed on animals with differing or inconclusive results. For example, some 25 gray treatments to animals gave incomplete clinical effect, suggesting a higher dose may be required, but clinical tr out treatment outcomes on humans with VT treated with 25 gray have been relatively successful. Additionally, the antiarrhythmic effect of cardiac radioablation has occurred much faster in clinical patients, despite myocardial fibrosis being a late radiation effect usually observed a couple of months after radiation. This highlights the complex and not yet well understood underlying radiobiology mechanism of cardiac radioablation. There is speculation that the radiobiology and dynamics of radiation-induced injury of healthy animal heart tissue may differ to that of myocardial scar in the human heart, or that there may be different mechanisms contributing to that antiarrhythmic effect, including inflammation, necrosis, and fibrosis. Most clinical treatment plans were able to meet SABE extracardiac organ at risk dose constraints and few toxicities have been reported, although we do not yet have long-term clinical data. Some clinical studies reported that planned PTV dose coverage was compromised to limit doses to the proximal conduction system, stomach, or esophagus. Treatment planning studies, specifically looking at atrial fibrillation, have reported that OAR dose constraints were often exceeded, even with small target volume expansions. Intracardiac structures also need to be considered, but currently there is little guidance on appropriate dose constraints. The Raventa Clinical Trial Team published intracardiac dose constraint recommendations, and the Washington University Group have reported their planned doses to intracardiac structures that could be used for future benchmarking. ICD electronics also need to be treated as an organ at risk. CyberKnife treatment plans typically use more EMU than CM Linux, and most CM Linux treatments have used 6 F VMAT. The higher dose rate of 6 F appears advantageous, and there's concern regarding the effect of using 10 MV on patients with ICD devices. A number of dose calculation algorithms found in commercial treatment planning systems have been used. The main questions with scientific gaps in treatment planning are radiobiology related. It is hopefully clear that we need further guidance, understanding and standardization of target definition and delineation, optimal target doses, appropriate organ at risk dose constraints and long-term toxicities. We obviously want to be able to see and irradiate the moving target very accurately, but more importantly, we need to know what the optimal target actually is, what dose we need to irradiate the target to, and what doses we need to spare the surrounding critical structures to in order to achieve effective treatment outcomes. Improved compatibility between cardiology contouring software and radiation oncology treatment planning systems, contour transfer tools and processes, and delineation guidelines should help reduce target delineation uncertainties or allow us to better understand the magnitude of these uncertainties. Automated target delineation tools could also be developed. Improved standardization and reporting would also allow us to collate and compare treatment outcomes from multiple centers and clinical trials. Lastly, on treatment delivery and follow-up. Detailed information regarding patient-specific quality assurance was rarely reported in publications beyond that standard SABRE QA clinical procedures were followed and passed. 
However, the Washington University group did detail their QA procedures, which included iron chamber measurements, epidosimetry, log file analysis, fill measurements, DVH comparisons, analyzing patient setup shift data, and establishing upper and lower control limits for planning and treatment parameters. I am going to focus on the treatment delivery of photon treatments, but the feasibility of heavy iron treatments is also being investigated and clinical proton treatments have been performed in at least two continents. Compared with photons, protons have the potential to reduce healthy tissue toxicity, but more research is needed to optimize motion management techniques and to determine the appropriate proton dose. But in terms of photon clinical treatment deliveries, for interfraction motion management, cyber knife treatments used X-ray-based translational and rotational spine alignment to set up the patient. CM Linux used 3D or 4D comb beam with bony and or ICD registrations. The MRI Linux treatment used 3D MRI to set up the patient and confirm the PTV, lung and heart alignment, and 2D sagittal cines were used to evaluate consistent target motion. For intrafraction motion management, cyber knife treatments use X-ray tracking of permanent or temporary fiducials for respiratory motion management. C-arm Linac treatments do not often use any form of real-time intrafraction motion management, but some groups performed repeat cone beams between multiple art deliveries, and one group used a respiratory gating using an external chest surrogate. The, the MRI Linac treatment used MR-guided expiration breath holds and lipidome tracking. Treatment times were shortest on C-arm Linacs, and the MRI Linac treatment delivery was longest at nearly two and a half hours, and this included 55 breath holds, reset ups, tracking interruptions, physician checks, and a patient toilet break. Because most clinical treatments have been for VT, the main mechanism of follow up to ascertain treatment success has been via ICD interrogation to compare the frequency of VT episodes before and after treatment. ECGs, chest X-rays, chest CT, echoes, and MRI have also been used. Cardiac rescue teams were often on standby during treatment delivery. This was partially because the patients were often very unwell and partially because most patients had ICDs and these were often disconnected or temporarily programmed to monitor only during treatment delivery. ICDs also challenge MRI-guided treatments, both in terms of MRI compatibility and causing artifacts that can disrupt MR guidance. However, at least one successful and safe treatment delivery has been performed on an MRI Linux on a patient with an ICD device. This is a significant step that paves the way towards MRI-guided cardiac radioablation. Theoretically, MR guidance provides advantages due to the real-time soft tissue target visualization and potential for real-time beam adaptation. However, the treatment reported in this study faced challenges with MR-guided tracking due to the ICD artifacts. MRI-guided treatments may be particularly well suited for AF because a smaller proportion of these patients have ICDs and the proximity of the target to critical organs at risk appears to be more challenging. There are also a lot of questions regarding the capabilities of MR-guided treatment deliveries to compensate for cardiac motion, considering the current temporal resolution of image acquisition and motion compensation techniques. Very recently at ISTRO, a group presented phantom experimental work and results on evaluating cardiac radioablation target motion compensation on the Elector Unity MRI Linux. In terms of current research and development opportunities in this area, there's a market for new QA phantoms with techniques tailored for cardiac radioablation and further evaluation of motion management strategies or the development of new techniques specifically tailored to cardiac radioablation target motion. MRI-guided and heavy iron treatments theoretically have a lot of advantages for this particular treatment application, but current limitations and workflow issues need to be overcome to make these optimal solutions for clinical patients. 
Determining the uncertainty in treatment delivery would also increase our understanding and confidence in cardiac radioablation treatments, but this may require the development of potentially better suited dosimetry methods. Further follow-up data would also be advantageous, including the registration of the follow-up data sets to the treatment plan itself. The development of imaging biomarkers that are predictive of long-term therapeutic effect is also another interesting area. Stepping back and looking at the big picture, currently a number of clinical treatments have been delivered, all with the same clinical goal, but many different techniques and procedures have been used. Clinical outcomes have varied, and currently there is insufficient data or consistent and detailed reporting to determine what may be causing this. Multi-center, multi-platform clinical trials with longer follow-up, consistent and detailed reporting, and treatment delivery verification data will help improve our understanding and confidence in cardiac radioablation. It is great to see a number of clinical trials have or are being established, including multi-center clinical trials such as the German Revent trial. StopStorm is another great European initiative that is actively looking at standardizing treatments and collating a large data set to help gain a better understanding and confidence in cardiac radioablation. And from a completely different perspective, Currently, we are using radiation oncology techniques and procedures for a different disease. As I mentioned with lung saber, the ability to transfer skills and technology is very advantageous, but we have a lot of highly intelligent and creative people in our field who may be able to come up with a better solution optimized specifically for cardiac radioablation. Earlier this year, Varian announced that they've received FDA breakthrough device designation for its cardiac radioablation system for VT. Currently, there are not a lot of details, but it'll be very interesting to see what comes from this. In summary, there is no doubt that further knowledge and technique development is required to make cardiac radioablation an effective, safe, and accessible treatment for patients currently suffering from cardiac arrhythmias. But to spin it more optimistically, this is also an exciting opportunity for medical physicists. If we can accurately and confidently treat small intracardiac targets with high radiation doses when the targets are undergoing complex cardiorespiratory motion and are very close to critical structures, then we should be able to tackle most oncology tumors. So I've tried to highlight some of the innovative and developmental work going ongoing around the world. Um, and for the last 10 minutes, I'm going to very briefly highlight some of the work ongoing within the ImageX Institute that is trying to make cardiac radioablation treatments more effective and accessible. As discussed earlier, these targets move with cardiorespiratory motion, and this can challenge our current imaging modalities, which are often prone to motion artifacts. To overcome this, a PhD student, Natasha Morton, is developing cardiac and respiratory adaptive CT to reduce cardiac motion artifacts in planning CT data sets. The software prospectively uses both cardiac ECG signals and respiratory signals to gate CT acquisitions in real time. In most cases, the imaging dose won't be more than a standard respiratory-gated 4D CT because only the data that is needed for reconstruction is acquired rather than using oversampling like standard retrospective 4D CT methods. So far, a proof-of-concept XCAT study has been performed and this found that the mean square error of cardiac substructures was reduced up to 57% compared to respiratory-gated 4D CT. Further work includes adapting the software to cope with arrhythmia ECG signals. The same problem also applies to cone beam CT acquisitions. To overcome this, Dr. Tess Reynolds and the ImageX team are working on motion-guided 4D cone beam CT. Conventional 4D cone beam methods acquires imaging data at a constant gantry velocity and projection frame rate. 
Because this acquisition is independent of the patient's respiration, this can cause large angular gaps between KV projections. Respiratory Motion Guided 4D Cone Beam monitors the patient's respiration and uses a signal to vary the gantry velocity and projection frame rate to achieve angular spacing between KV projections. The team have tested this technology in lung cancer patients and showed that it reduced imaging dose by 85% and scan time by 75% compared to conventional 4D cone beam. TESS has expanded this work to cardiorespiratory adaptive imaging by adjusting image acquisition in accordance to both the cardiac signal derived from an ECG and the respiratory signal of the patient. To date, a simulation study has been performed. This saw a significant reduction in cardiac and respiratory motion artifacts in the tumor and heart, as well as a reduction in scan time and imaging dose. TESS is in the process of implementing this on a LINAC and a robotic C arm. As we've heard, cardiac radioablation relies on the accurate delivery of high radiation doses to small and mobile targets. We do not yet have a good understanding of the cardiac radiobiology, so real-time targeting and beam adaption tools may be beneficial if they can reduce the dose to healthy surrounding cardiac tissue. Dr. Trang Yuan is investigating whether the established killer voltage intrafraction monitoring technology, or KIM, could be expanded to cardiac radioablation. KIM is a software solution developed within ImageX that can be incorporated on a standard LINAC to monitor both translational and rotational motion of fiducials during treatment delivery. It has already been used to treat over 100 patients in three continents for prostate, lung, liver, and pancreas cancers. It can track objects real time with some millimeter accuracy, and this information can then be used to either gate treatment delivery or steer radiation to the moving target. Trang has extended the software to track ICD leads, which you can see as the red cross in the simulation video. The idea is that this could be used to reduce the target volume in VT patients with ICDs, and this is predicted to improve healthy heart function after treatment. The same cardiac radioablation problem is also being tackled in another way by PhD student and Fulbright scholar Nicholas Hindmay, who has developed CardiTrack to non-invasively track the respiratory component of cardiac targets using KV imaging. This software uses a predefined relationship between diaphragm and target motion and the assumption that respiratory induced target motion is correlated to diaphragm motion. Then during treatment delivery, the diaphragm is tracked on KV projections and the location of the target is derived. The proof of concept of CardiTrack has been illustrated in a simulation study using the digital XCAT Phantom. On the right, you can see the diaphragm being tracked in blue and the left atria in solid red. The green contour is the ground truth target contour and is, and is exhibiting both cardiac and respiratory induced motion. You can probably see that on the KV images, it is extremely hard to see the heart, let alone cardiac substructures, but this software is able to accurately track these structures despite this. The simulation study found that CardiTrack reduced PTV volumes by 11 to 24%, which would result in less healthy cardiac tissue being irradiated to very high doses. Most clinical cardiac radioablation treatments to date have been for VT. A couple of clinical treatments for atrial fibrillation have been reported, but the rate of arrhythmia recurrence has been higher. We hypothesize that cardiac radioablation for AF presents additional challenges. Even just looking at the two different general target regions, you can see that the AF target is much thinner, walled and close to many critical structures compared to the ventricles. Plus, as we saw earlier, full circumferential scarring is usually required around the pulmonary veins to block the unwanted signals from entering the atria in order to achieve therapeutic effect, 
but unlike catheter ablation, cardiac radioablation most likely will not allow for real-time electrical stimulation testing to determine if sufficient ablation has been performed. Two treatment targets are also often required for AEF, one on the left and another on the right of the left atria. And our motion characterization studies showed that these targets move differentially in the medial lateral direction, presenting an additional motion management challenge. Here you can see two exemplar targets in red. As the left atria dilates, they move apart from each other medially, and as the left atria contracts, they move closer together. The study also showed that nearby structures, including the left atria, were not always suitable surrogates for cardiac induced target motion. Additionally, you can see the target proximity to critical structures. Multiple studies have shown that the target can be in direct contact with the esophagus as well as other critical structures. A treatment planning study indicated that target margin expansions of three mils or less are required to ensure adequate sparing of critical structures. And target motion studies have illustrated that target motion is often larger than this, implying that direct motion compensation may be required. Additionally, AEF patients may fluctuate between normal sinus rhythm and arrhythmia, with target motion potentially differing between these two states. So I have been looking at whether MRI-guided treatment deliveries could help overcome these additional challenges. Because cardiac motion is not always insignificant, we've been specifically looking at whether we could account for cardiorespiratory motion combined with MRI target tracking and MLC tracking to reduce the amount of healthy tissue irradiated. However, this also brings challenges and there are a number of questions that need to be answered, such as can we even see the target with MRI? Can we track the targets with MRI? Is MLC tracking suitable for cardiorespiratory motion? And is current or future temporal resolution of both imaging and beam adaptation suitable for the high frequency cardiac motion? We have developed MRI-based target tracking software within MIM to track cardiac-induced target motion. This is to illustrate the proof of concept as well as evaluate whether MRI-guided tracking of cardiac-induced target motion is worthwhile compared to perhaps more simplistic motion management strategies. We retrospectively tested our algorithm on MRI acquisitions from healthy and AF participants. So shown on the right are exemplar breath holds Denise acquired on two study participants that are representative of the image acquisition and quality that may be achievable on MRI Linux. In red are the two treatment targets being tracked non-invasively. On average, the 3D tracking error was 1.7 mils, and this was on average 1.3 mils smaller than the 3D target displacement. This illustrates that MR tracking of AF cardiac rate ablation targets is feasible despite the complex cardiac-induced target motion and limited target contrast. Once we know the target position in real time, we then want to be able to steer the radiation to these moving targets in real time. So we also investigated whether MLC tracking is suitable for cardiorespiratory target motion with a phantom study using human motion traces on a standard Linux. This found that compared to treatment deliveries without MLC tracking, MLC tracking significantly improved gamma pass rates and improved target dose coverage without significant changes to OAR doses despite this complex cardiorespiratory target motion. Shown here is the reconstructed delivered dose of one of the plans on a patient CT data set. The target contours are shown in red and the color wash represents dose that is equal or higher than the prescription dose. As you can see, without MLC tracking, we did not achieve target coverage. In this scenario, the patient would likely have received very high radiation doses with potentially absolutely no therapeutic benefit. However, with MLC tracking, we were able to achieve good target dose coverage, suggesting likely favorable clinical outcomes. So that very quickly highlighted some of the exciting work that the ImageX team are working on to help make cardiac radioablation an effective, safe, and accessible treatment to the patients currently suffering from cardiac arrhythmias. 
It is a very exciting and rapidly developing field that could potentially significantly and positively improve the clinical outcomes of those suffering from cardiac arrhythmias. But we still have a lot to learn and there are many advancement opportunities. Lastly, I'd like to thank the following people for providing content or input into this presentation. Thank you. That was a fantastic presentation, Susie. Greatly appreciate it. Uh, I have some questions from the audience, but also it appears that you have had a helper in the audience because Oliver Blank, whose uh, oh, right. publications you have shown, hello, Oliver, is in the audience and he has been answering some of those questions in the background. Oliver. Thanks, Oliver. <laughs> I don't know whether you can unmute yourself. Yes, I can. Thank you. Perfect. Yeah. Very wonderful presentation. <clears throat> yeah. So, Susie, do you mind if I ask Oliver to also maybe allow you to uh, talk to some of the questions? That would be great. Yeah. So you can share the question and answers uh, together. So I'll take advantage, Oliver, putting you on the spot since we have you uh, with us tonight, if that is okay. Sure, but yes. Susie can answer too. <laughs> yes, absolutely. So I'll leave it to you to, to, uh, to discuss. And maybe before we start question and answers, sorry to be pain. Magdalena, can we quickly run the questions, our poll, just to check uh, how much people have uh, learned? Let's see whether Magdalena can start it first. Maybe before we see the poll, I will ask uh, if the 4D gating images uh, have signal loss due to heart beating, will you use the scan for planning? Okay. I don't know who can, <laughs> okay, so can I please ask people not to log off yet? Can you please? So this looks quite positive rather than having majority, I know absolutely nothing or I have heard about it. We now have more people saying that they can briefly describe the basic concepts or hold a short conversation. Thank you so much. Magdalena, can I please have question two? Compared to atrial fibrillation, ventricular tachycardia is more common. Please, single choice. The right Again. answer has actually been repeated twice. Okay. So yes, the uh, third option and the last option is more commonly treated. So again, we have people now picking up the correct answer. Thank you, Magdalena. Can I have question three, please? In your opinion, cardiac radioablation? Please select the right answer. Fantastic. Once again, we have the people picking the right answer. So everyone has been listening, or at least most. Thank you. And can I have the last question, please? And similarly, people seem to be picking the right answer. But of course, as we remember from Susie's talk, we are expecting that the number to double in the next five to 10 years, which is sort of a, quite a considerable health burden. Thank you so much, Magdalena. I think we can, we can stop now.
and uh, I will quickly proceed to questions and answers. So back to my original questions, can you use a 4D CT scan if some information have been lost? Yeah, the, um, the publications regarding clinical treatments have reported using either the 3D or the 4D. In terms of how they use the 4D, in terms of average MIP, hasn't always been clearly detailed in the publications. Um, Oliver, did you want to speak in terms of your clinical experience? Unmute yourself, please. Can you unmute? Now, now it works. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> Perfect, sorry. Yeah, so we do a 4D uh, respiratory CT standard planning as in lung saver, and we do additionally a, um, a contrast enhanced uh, cardiac gated CT with uh, 10 phases to combine the two. So you cannot get uh, the cardiac information out of the respiratory motion uh, 4D CT, of course. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Now, there was a question about the DICOM, whether DICOM can be used to transfer the electrophysiological information on the imaging information. And that seems to be a bit of an issue. <clears throat> yeah, sorry, very, very painful. <clears throat> um, the cardiology world, they use mesh and VTK structures at the moment, and uh, they have no DICOM standards. So um, we are really uh, into the in-house solutions right now. Uh, and uh, Slicer 3D software can now be used too, um, but otherwise it's really, really tricky <clears throat> at the okay. moment. Yes. So I think this one, can you give more information how to fuse the information? Is there a special software? So I think you answered that. Uh, Lydia, would you like to add anything to it? Uh, no, other than what I said in the Indeed, presentation. Lydia, <laughs> That's right, I quite often give that. Um, yeah, no, just what I said in the um, presentation, yeah. Yeah. Now, would HDR brachytherapy be an option? You know, I remember the days of endovascular brachytherapy that we use for restenosis. And yeah. maybe that way you can guide the radiation a bit better. Yeah, so radiotherapy, uh, brachytherapy was initially explored. Um, so in that uh, um, review article, we have um, cited a few papers where um, they did use brachytherapy. It wasn't, it hasn't seemed to be as successful. Um, it, it likewise has its challenges. Um, you know, it, even with using it for stents has reduced and, um, you know, they don't use it as often now. Um, and it's all invasive. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oliver, did you want to have anything no, to add? It has, not, it has not been tried yet on brachytherapy. Uh, it might be interesting, but we want to do it uh, non-invasively, uh, completely from, from the outside. So that's the, that's the charm of the procedure. And yeah. <clears throat> uh, well, may, maybe in the future, uh, but as of now, there's no, there's no motion for that. Um, and unfortunately, I have to leave in, uh, into the next meeting. My clinicians are already looking at me. <laughs> so thank you, uh, Susie. Wonderful talk. Um, if a great presentation. Awesome. Thank you very much to be here. Thanks. Thank you to have you, Oliver. Yeah, thank you. Great to have you. Susie, with your MRI-guided radioablation MLC tracking technique, is it suitable both for ventricular and atrial arrhythmia? Uh, yeah, so it's very much in the preliminary stages. Um, so in terms of the MR-guided tracking, we have specifically looked at atrial fibrillation targets um, because this is a cohort of patients that don't often have ICD devices and therefore there's less artifacts in the MRI images. Um, for VT patients, the MR-guided tracking may be more challenging um, because of those ICD artifacts, um, well, the artifacts caused by ICDs, and we haven't explored that in our work. In terms of the MLC tracking for steering the radiation to the moving targets, um, uh, those results should be fairly applicable to both um, targets, um, so for AF and VT, but we did specifically plan for atrial fibrillation. So we had atrial fibrillation targets and our motion trajectories were derived from um, humans using ultrasound, but we were tracking um, parts of the heart that was very close to the atrial fibrillation target specifically. Um, so we haven't explored for VT. 
Can I ask you, how do you select patients for radio ablations? Are these the cohorts who are not suitable for drugs, ICD or RF ablation? And are you worried about negative radiation side effects, including risk of cancer? Yes, yeah, yep, yeah, exactly. Um, so most treatments, if not all, have been um, essentially palliative treatment options. Um, so these are patients that have tried all treatment options currently available to them and essentially have, you know, have not responded to that, are still suffering, have poor quality of life. So these patients often have reduced life expectancies. Um, so they're not expected to live significantly in terms of, I mean, there's still the risk of secondary malignancies, but that is reduced. Um, and secondly, we don't have the long-term clinical data. Um, mm -hmm. These clinical treatments haven't been occurring for very long, um, and we don't have the long-term clinical data to get an idea of those cardiac toxicities long-term. But yes, that's definitely a concern. Um, and that's why there's still a lot to learn about the underlying cardiac radiobiology um, to ensure that we can provide a safe treatment. Um, for atrial fibrillation patients, these patients generally have longer life expectancies. Um, so that's another challenge and perhaps why the clinical uptake of cardiac radioablation has, it's one of the reasons why it hasn't been as large for atrial fibrillation, because that the secondary side effects and the long-term toxicities would be more of a um, factor. Okay, thank you so much, Susie. I will have one last question. If you are using ITV approach, do you still want to use MLC tracking method as ITV should cover the change in GTV position change with time? Yeah, so we were exploring um, MR guided tracking and MLC tracking as an alternative to an ITV. Um, so particularly with atrial fibrillation, if you've got if you're using an ITV, it's really hard to protect those surrounding critical structures um, and create treatment plans where you're not exceeding the cardiac the atrial shroud cardiac structures um, dose constraints. So that is why the main purpose of doing the work that can we use MR guided tracking and MLC tracking to just track the target volume with potentially a small um, margin, but irradiating a lot less tissue than if we were doing an ITV method. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Susie, thank you. Thank you very much. Can I please ask you to stop sharing your screen so that I'll just say goodbye to everyone with one last slide? I will share my screen and share. Uh, I will just would like to let, can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah, I would like just to remind all the participants that following this fantastic lecture, we will have another fantastic webinar that will be held on 6th of October. And the presenter will be Professor George Xu from the University of Science and Technology in China, who will be talking on new tools of phantoms, Monte Carlo calculations and AI for medical physics applications. And the moderator for this talk is uh, Professor Madan Rehani. So with that, I would like to thank Susie again, as well as all of the participants. Uh, I hope you all learned something today and I will see you in a month. All the best. Good night. Thank you, Susie.